ladies and gentlemen, when I started my career as a compensation expert 15 years ago, my father invited me to a nice restaurant across town, the Kronenhalle, because he had a friend from New York, a businessman from New York, and he proudly told this business friend, my son is going to become a compensation expert. So this friend from New York, um, you know, was a shrewd businessman. He was in something you would today call digital media. At that time, it was analog. He sold information over the telephone. It was a very hard business, and he was successful in this very hard business, which is why he was very clear what a good incentive system would be. He told me, Herman, I tell you what a good incentive system is. My CEO has to buy a lot of shares in the company, and I load him up with debt that he can buy these shares. So whenever something goes wrong with the company, he's going to be bankrupt. This is a strong motivation. This was my first, uh, was my first experience of something that I became to learn uh, is actually to everywhere. Whenever you meet someone, you find a compensation expert. Because we all know how people should be incentivized. Unfortunately, uh, during the time of uh, my working, I found a few misconcepts in compensation that are widespread. And I wanted today to talk about these misconcepts. The first is executives are greedy. The second one is, maybe startling for you as financial experts, you should link compensation to profits. Because you know, if the profit go up, the, the, the CEO should make money, which means then you will get the maximum amount of profits. I will show you how wrong that can be. And the final one is a very classic example of the carrot and stick. You know, if you give somebody, someone a target that they should achieve, and you compensate the person for it, then this person should do everything to reach that target. Let's start, let's start with the first fairy tale. Executive are greedy. In the media, you can only hear that executives are greedy. And this is the main problem why we have high executive salaries today. As a matter of fact, here in Switzerland, we changed the constitution because people thought executives are too greedy. The Abzugrinitiative in German can be loosely translated to the greed referendum. You know, we actually voted that, you know, we should make changes to the law, to the constitution actually, that there is less greed with the CEOs. I'd like to show you that there is a much better explanation for it. But before I show that to you, let's make a little role play. Let's assume you are board members board members of a publicly quoted company, and I'm your new CEO. I'm your new CEO. I went through a very tough selection process. And we all know in this room, I'm the best CEO for you. Now, in my personal case, that's not the case, probably. But let's assume I'm the best CEO. You took a lot of effort to, to get me there. And now we are in the last round of negotiations, which is the salary. You know, salary should not really be the dominant aspect of hiring a CEO, so you do it at the end. And both of us get information about what a typical CEO would make. And I put an example together for you. Let's assume your CEO, uh oh, your CEO makes, um, uh, the, the CEOs, the peer CEOs, make. Um, on, av on average, a medium, 450,000 francs a year. The, the best paid are making 850,000, and the ones with the lowest salary make 250,000 a year. Now, my question to you as board member, what would you pay me? What would you offer me? Medium. Medium. <laughs> some would say medium, some would say below medium, and some would say above medium. I ask this every class I go to. And we also ask this about 200 students and about 20 or 30 compensation experts. And this is the result. When you look at, when you look at what I've given you, this is the benchmark. This is the median. And this is, these are like the upper and lower quartiles and deciles uh, of the peers. Whatever I get out is typically about 23% on average higher 
than the benchmark we provided. I call this the wage anchor effect. If you have an anchor, if you know what the other people do, you cannot pay your CEO less than what everybody else pays, with a couple of exceptions. And a couple of exceptions that pay exactly the same. But the true problem is that whenever pay is transparent, it increases. It increases. It's actually not theoretic. I went. Uh, uh, I had lunch just, just across from Cronin Hall in the terrace with the CEO myself, who told me, you know what? My board came to me and said I should earn 80,000 francs more. And I, I didn't ask for the money. I don't know why. I asked them, why do I have to earn 80,000 francs more? And the board told me, we benchmarked it. Don't, don't trust us. You know, it's, it's, it's right. Um, as a matter of fact, if you are board members, our biggest problem is to lose your CEO. This is the biggest problem because then the company is not managed anymore and you are in responsibility. So as board members, you have to make sure you are not underpaying your CEO. I believe this is a much better explanation of increasing CEO salaries that we have seen in the past. Because we make it transparent, it increases automatically. As a matter of fact, there is uh, something else also really interesting, which is, you know, the top wages typically come down. You know, even the top quartile just increased a little bit. The lower wages are those that are corrected upwards. So it's actually not a, a really bad process. People that are earning not enough are making more, but it has a self-fulfilling prophecy to increase and increase and increase. And as a matter of fact, just yes, last week Price Waterhouse came out with a new study on how CEO salaries developed in Switzerland. And it is interesting to know that the SMI, the index of the large companies, saw a decrease in CEO salaries. And the other one, the SMIME, the, the, the mid-level mid uh, companies saw an increase of 33% in the median. So it's exactly what you see happening here in this little experiment together. Um, uh, it's exactly what's happening in, the, in real time. And I believe this is a really a strong driver of pay. Look at what happened to a very famous uh, CEO in the UK. Mr. Van der Meer uh, was hired in 2004 for 1.5 million euros. When he left the company in 2008, he made 10.3 million euros. And the fascinating thing about that is, he said, if he had earned less, he wouldn't have worked less. If he had earned more, it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have you know, worked more. He can't work more. There are so many incentives at the CEO level that it's almost impossible to perform better than what you would anyway, than how you would anyway perform um, if you if you're in that job. And funny enough, uh, in 2002, the UK started to require disclosure of CEO pay. So he started at the time when salaries were still reasonably high, you know, good salaries for CEOs. But then the UK required disclosure of CEO pay. And from then on, it decreased dramatically. More than you know, doubled in the first year, almost doubled in the second year, and so on. But there is also a second driver. There is a second driver, driver of high CEO pay. Let me let me give you an example of this. When you look at compensation, a typical function works like this: the better you perform, the higher your compensation. This is a very classical example. Almost, you know, as a compensation expert, you always come across this issue. And let's make a little play here too. Let's assume your performance metric is revenue growth. I pick revenue growth not because I think it's the most important performance metric, because it's, but because it's one that is easily to, uh, to, to imagine, uh, kind of to imagine. Let's assume we agreed that our target should be 8% growth. As a matter of fact, 8% growth was the average growth of a large German company from 2001 to 2011. So we know in that period, 8% growth would be a reasonable target for a CEO. Now the big question is, where would you set the caps and the floor? Where would you not pay any more? At what growth would you not pay any more? And at what growth, you know, at what performance, at what revenue growth would you make the cap? Where would you stop paying?
typically, when I ask students, and I again did that for hundreds of students, when I ask them, I also do it for board members, by the way, in a board uh, education, when I ask them, you know, where they would set the floor, they would they typically set it around zero to four to maybe six percent, and the median is four percent, typically. People think when you have to grow by eight percent, you shouldn't get anything if you just grow four percent on the median. And when you then ask for the cap, it's about, you know, symmetric. So at around 12 to 14 percent on the median, there should be a cap. That's how we typically think of numbers. When we believe 8 percent is a reasonable goal for a company, then 4 percent should be the floor and 12, 14 percent should be the cap. Now if I go back to those 80 companies and look how much they actually grew, the fascinating thing is that more than one third grew less than 4 percent. This is, you know, all the performance is below 4 percent. This is the performance from 4 to 8 percent. And this is the performance from, four uh, from 8 to 14 percent. Only one third of the companies actually performs within the sweet spot of what normal people would think is, a, re is a reasonable, a reasonable uh, interval for payments. In other words, in two thirds of the cases, you would have a bonus system that doesn't work anymore. Which, which not yet explains why salaries are very high, but the fact is that there are quite a few companies that don't set caps. So they pay, you know, double, three times, four times, five times up there, which gets you very high salaries. This is not theoretical. Maybe you've been here in 2009 when Brady Dugan received 70 million Swiss francs in a long-term incentive plan where his performance was measured over four or five years. I think it was five years. And that performance incentive plan was based on stock price returns. And the amazing thing was the stock price for Credit Suisse didn't move at that time. What happened? Credit Suisse thought they're especially responsible by only paying for our performance of the peers. So if you go back to you know, stock prices, they also move by about, or have a return of about 80% per year. So you could imagine when the they assumed when the stock price you know, grows like everybody else, it's going to be around 8% per year. So maybe at 16% you know, or 8% above the median, we may pay a good bonus. At 16% at, at, at above peers, we can pay a significant bonus. At 50% more than, you know, 50% better than peers, and to, uh, I think one of those peers must have been UBS in Switzerland, the only couple that they used. If you, 50, if you grow by 50% more than UBS, you really deserve an incredibly high bonus. Everybody would assume that is normal. Everybody, you know, including me, because we all have a very bad grab of financial numbers and what can happen to that. Then let's look at what actually happened to the stock prices. This is the stock price of Credit Suisse, which was roughly there where it started at the beginning of the long-term incentive plan. And this is the stock price of one of the peers, UBS. Even though the stock price didn't move, the outperformance of Credit Suisse over UBS in 2009, when the long-term incentive plan actually vested, was over 180% something you could never imagine. I believe this is a much stronger um, reason for the high salaries that we see today. And when we come back to the questions at the beginning, maybe CEOs are a little bit greedy. But is it a good explanation for the high salaries we see? I believe not. I think the explanations that it's transparency of their pay, of their pay and leverage in the pay are much stronger drivers of high, of high CEO pay that you see today. And this but don't you think they're playing that game? They, they, they're taking advantage of it. You, you, you have reasons why it's going on, which, which makes sense. 
but they, they know these reasons and they take advantage of these reasons. Even if I don't assume that they take advantage of the reasons, and uh, when you talk to CEOs, you realize this, these are actually not important questions for them. When they take over a new job, they're worried that they're going to go you know, belly up or that they are not going to perform like their predecessor. And these questions are so much more important than salary for most of the CEOs that you could never explain why CEOs on average, CEO pay on average increases by 33%. On the other hand, the reasons I showed you are perfectly, you know, are, are, are things that are happening and they're perfectly capable of explaining the high pay. You know, if, if pay increases by an average of 23% every year, because it's transparent, if that phenomenon actually holds true, that explains already quite a bit of the salary increase we saw. But the survey, what, which kind of represents what the board would take, I would be curious what the CEO offered. You, you, you said, you're showing what the board's willing to pay. I would like to know what the CEO demands, what, what he puts on the table. You, you well, the typical CEO, you know, doesn't really make a demand. He says, like, let's see what the other earn. I just want to see what the other earn. And then we're sitting across from each other. Would we agree on a below average salary? <laughs> I, it's very unlikely, you know. It's very unlikely that reasonable people who believe, you know, they're, they're good performers, they're right for the job, agree on a below average salary. It's very, it's very unlikely. But it, it's really important to know this because the Mindri Itzatife, you know, the greed referendum, assumed that executives are greedy. It addresses the wrong problem. ISS, one of the largest shareholder advisors, says that they are looking extremely uh, 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 exact on performance criteria. They want to, you know, they want to have stringent performance criteria, which means their leverage is higher. You know, if you, if you make it very, very performance dependent, the salaries, that means salaries are going to, you know, move stronger with the cycle than otherwise. So shareholder advisors ask exactly the contrary from what would <laughs> prevent high pay for CEOs. You know, having that in mind, you know, when you look at proposals, um, uh, how to change the regulatory environment um, is extremely important because if you assume it's just greedy CEOs, you come to complete different solutions than when you're aware. Our problem is transparency and leverage. If you're, if you're aware of that, you, you, you have to look for the solution someplace else. Yeah, it's hard for me too, and we can't revert it anyway. <laughs> so it's, it's not something we can revert, but if we are aware that this is the reason, we are going to try to find solutions that, ad that address the reason. And this is not happening today, because still today when I talk to someone about this you know, situation, even without reading what I say, they write back, yeah, I just think they're greedy. It's, it's very widespread. Yeah. Question with regards to the caps, do you have any numbers how many companies get to use caps to payments? Right? Because you said, I mean, it's very much open. We have to me, it's kind of obvious to say, I mean, since we know that, we put caps in there. Yeah, so that's it. The, the, the tendency now is to move to caps. Is there a percentage amount? Would you say one third of the companies are doing that now? I don't know exactly, but I would say the majority nowadays has caps. Unfortunately, you know, this share price based or options, for instance, don't have caps, caps by nature. And um, I actually didn't want to show this chart, but um, when you look at um, uh, when you look at what happened when Bill Clinton introduced that you can only deduct one million in salary and nothing above, um, except options. You know what actually happened? You know salaries increased a lot more, and all of that that was increased. All of that is stock pays pay and option pays pay. So again, because we're not aware of the reason of, of our problem, we are making the wrong legislation. You know, we, we are not aware that options are a big problem, which options are never kept. We allow options or we even recommend options. And, and that's something where uh, I think uh, we have to we all have to be aware of that because you may actually be confronted with the question, how should I structure an incentive plan? And, and there are two things that you can learn from this. And one is be careful with benchmarks. 
because they're going to increase your cost. So it's better to ask the CEO, how much do you want? And if the CEO says, I want that much, better not even ask what the competition does. If you can afford it, pay that, because it's going to be less than when you ask what the competition earns. And the second thing is when you have to structure an incentive plan and somebody comes, let's make it really, you know, really motivating. <laughs> let's put in a lot of leverage. That's exactly the contrary from what you want. It's, it's basically the message from. What, uh, may I ask, what kind of acceptance, acceptance do you get from boards uh, with your recommendation mm -hmm. that you should not use benchmarks? Because a lot of the discussion about compensation is based on benchmark, and it takes a bit of strong will and strong argumentation to get away from that. And you know, there's always the uh, problem that if you are the first one who does something different, and for whatever reason it doesn't turn out to be quite good, uh, that one can for it. Yeah, well, it's, the world is not black and white. There are some situations where a benchmark could be done, but doesn't have to be done. In that situation, I typically ask, you know, I tell people, recommend to people, why don't you ask first what the CEO wants? And if you can agree with that, why don't you go for that? If it's not possible, of course, because maybe the shareholders demand a benchmark, you know, there's no room to, you know, to play. Then you have to go with the flow and the wages are going to increase. Let's go to the second story. <laughs> uh, let's come to the second uh, fairy tale in compensation. You know, this uh, Mark Goldman was his name. Uh, he, um, he said, link, you know, link the salary very strong to the performance of the company. In his case, it was stock profits, you know, stock returns, but operating profits is the same thing. It's a widespread assumption that when you link CEO pay to, um, to uh, profits, that uh, this will actually mean higher profits. Um, I brought an example for you. What you see here is sales, EBIT, and uh, a company with six years. You know, I can only see five of the six years because uh, it's cut off from the projector. Um, now my question to you is, what do you think is the best year for this company? Look, you just have two numbers, just sales, just profits. What do you think is the best year? <laughs> Other opinions? Six has the higher sales and two has the higher sales. So. Yeah. The point I want to make here, I don't walk you through the exercise I do with the students, is we can't agree on financial performance. I mean, typically they say 2002 has a, you know, good growth, good, good margin, so some select 2002. Some say 2003 we have tremendous growth and actually the margin is not that bad. And others again say 2007, which you can't see, which has the highest debit. Uh, and unfortunately, can't see. So, and then I typically let them vote. And I don't only do it with students; I do it with board members too. And the amazing thing is, we cannot agree on performance. I typically move then to the next quest question and ask, which one? It's the same numbers. Is is the most valuable company? And then they always pick the one with the highest debit. And then I tell them, okay, when EBIT is the most important number, we should look at growth of EBIT, and that gives me then a new year, 2005, because here EBIT grew the most, uh, Delta EBIT, 160, 160. So we have three or four years out of six years that, are, that people cannot agree on which one is the best year. And that's a huge problem in, in compensation. If you can't agree on the performance metric, if you can't agree that a certain performance uh, metric is, explains the whole situation, then you can't pay a bonus on it. To show you how relevant this is, I found a statement from, uh, from um, a Duke Niederauer, who was CEO of uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And he said, uh, because um, he, he got 1.8 times you know, the average of other CEOs, he said, the board said there, um, the stock price is a very bad metric 
for performance measurement. So if stock exchanges don't believe in stock prices anymore, <laughs> it's, it's a little bit humoristic, but, but then you see actually how problematic it is to work with financial numbers. The more important thing, though, is a couple of examples. Let's assume you have a company that has two products, A and B. And for these two, you know, one sells 100, one sells 50, one at the margin of 20%, one at the margin of 10%. Combined, it's a margin of 17%. How can you, let's assume you're on the profit margin, you're, you're incentivized on the profit margin, something we before said, you know, could be an interesting metric. How can you increase the profit margin the easiest? Sell less of product A. <laughs> B. Yes, you're right. Sell less of product B. Absolutely. Because you're all CFA <laughs> Institute uh, alumni, you found it out right away. Typically, they say, well, you have to cost, cut the cost here, <laughs> or you have to sell more of A. I mean, this is the honest answer. And this is what everybody believes. If I incentivize here on the margin, of course the margin will go up, and the profit will go up too. But it's not true. It's a motivation to sell less of low pro uh, profit margin products. And this is not unrealistic. There are many companies that use profit margins in their incentive compensation. And the message it gives, sell less. Does it make sense? I had a company that uh, had a clear growth strategy and only used profits in the compensation. At the end of the year, you know, the board said growth growth target achieved, they were in the 75th percentile in terms of growth, but their profit was still the same as the year before. Why? It costs something to grow. I mean, if, if you want companies to grow, you cannot just focus on, say, uh, on profits, because even, in the long, even if in the long term, only bigger companies will have bigger profits, in the short term, which matters, people will act differently. They will focus on the short term gain. What are your thoughts about economic profit? Um, that, would that be fo you, you could gain that too, I guess. Or yeah, let's look at the at the fairy tale of economic profit. I learned this when I consulted uh, a company who does glass bottles. What they have is they have big basins where they have the glass. They they boil the glass or they they make it really hot, and then they need probably concrete basins to 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 hold the glass. And after twenty years. The whole concrete is gone. It's just, you know, went into glass. So every 20 years, they have to make a big new investment into a new concrete basin. And there I really realized something about economic profit. <laughs> there I could really realize it. You know, this is another example of a company making a profit of 25 each year with an investment that starts at 100, is depreciated towards, you know, zero, and then when it's zero, we buy a new investment. What happens to economic profit? Well, your capital decreases with your depreciation, which means your capital charge decreases too. And your economic profit miraculously you know, goes up and up and up until you have to make a reinvestment and it goes back down. Does it make, does it, is that performance, are these years better than the last year? No. These years are all the same because you know, we just have to buy a new make a new investment every f four, f four, four years, five years. And economic profit, you know, basically has a fundamental problem. You're comparing costs for the future with returns of investments of the past. Your return here comes from the past, from an investment in the past. Your cost comes from an investment in the future. <laughs> it's a fundamental conflict of the period you're looking at. What is the incentive here? Do not invest anymore. If, I, if somebody's on an economic profit plan, what I recommend to do is just wait and see. Your economic profit is going to increase. <laughs> Combine that with what we said about profits, the easiest way to improve the profit is to sell less. You know, I mean, to cut costs, basically. So using, using a only profit-based <laughs> metrics, which is really fashionable. A lot of people say it should only be profits. That's the only thing that counts for us. 
actually motivates people to not invest and to not sell. As a matter of fact, when you compare profits to your share price, it gets even worse. It's called your earnings per share. If you compare profits to your share price, what is the biggest incentive to do? Is to buy back shares. Just a week ago in the Financial Times, <laughs> I read that in the US this year, last year, 500 billion US dollars was bought back from, shares were bought back from the investors. There's no value added. These companies in the US don't believe they can do more with the money than their shareholders. Even worse, the shareholders think they should pay the money back. Yesterday, I had a friend from a FTSE 250 company uh, at my house uh, for dinner and uh, to sleep over. And he, you know, very late at night, he told me, you know what, we're making losses until now. Now we make a profit. You know what comes? The first question shareholders ask is, when are you going to pay it out? And Adam, uh, Andrew Smithers, a, a UK analyst, even argues that this may be the reason why we have so, so much slow growth, because of earnings per share based incentives, profit margin based incentives, economic profit based incentives. They all motivate to actually reduce and not to grow. It's a serious problem. Mm. So my economic profit would motivate you to invest because you want to create value. And if you have a positive spread business, you're going to grow with it. The problem is actually the time delay. This is really the problem. People don't think so long term. If they would think long term, they wouldn't pay back 500 million US dollars. The investor wouldn't demand it because they would believe in the long term it's best invested with the company because that's their job. Well, you could also say that the, the companies are paying your back is that if they're afraid to invest, they're afraid to increase their, their asset base. Why are they afraid? Maybe for political reasons, for tax reasons. Mm -hmm. But they're strongly motivated to pay back because of earnings based you said it, you compensation. Said the CEO wasn't greedy. Yeah, but still, it, I, I said yeah. you don't have to be greedy to be rational. You know, it doesn't, I mean. No, I, I disagree. I think if he's paying it back, he's being greedy because he's looking short sighted. No, I don't think so. Now, greed is for me uh, kind of maximize my profit. Well, that's what he's doing by buying back shares. No, it's, that's what the shareholders want from him. It's a rational thing to do. When, when shareholders want more profit? No, everybody knows if you have a positive spread business and you can grow, it's great for the share price. That's just, that's just it's very idealistic. That's my belief. It's very idealistic. I think yeah. when you want companies to grow, you have to incentivize them on growth. And hardly anybody does that. So when I, when I conclude basically you know, this fairy tale, I think the most important, uh, uh, the most important uh, part is that uh, it's very hard to agree on financial performance, never limit it just to profits, and always think about growth whenever you make an incentive. Because grow, growth is something where there's a short-term incentive to invest and grow. I really think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a strong disincentive. So if it is the answer or not that you should really be looking into what type of financial metric you should be using for a specific company. I think your example, you know, this company with the, the concrete base, etc. there you, you, you can manipulate indeed, you know, as you said, you can manipulate a certain metric, but if the board clearly outlines what the target for the CEO is to grow the company, then you measure it on, on sales growth, for example. But of course, you cannot just do that without ignoring the profit margin, but if you set the right metrics, that the board wants the company to achieve, then you can still use financial measures, no? Let's come you to the... You put thought in it. I mean, I agree with you. You shouldn't just take profit or, or whatever, but if you put thought in it as a board to say, these are the metrics that I want the company to achieve because that's good for the company in the long run, mm -hmm. you can still use financial measures to incentivize the company. Just keep in mind that we will never agree on the financial performance. <laughs> Even if you make up your mind what the right metrics are, at the end of the day, there won't be agreement that achieving these metrics has actually been a good performance. So why is that? 
We can't agree on performance. <laughs> There's so many aspects on it. No, but I mean, any single company board, maybe the whole society can't agree on what is the best for company A, for company B. But the board of company A hopefully can sit down together. And I'm not saying this is, a, is something for 10 minutes, but if they really go for it and say, what do we really want for the company? First, yeah. what do we want companies to grow profits, to be stable, to do whatever? Global penetration. Then you measure what you want. And then you put down the goals. And then you say, okay, how are we going to measure those goals? And again, you need to put thought in this, but hopefully the board can between themselves and the board and the CEO can agree on what the targets are. Well, the situation is I experience in any group that I you know, put together that there's not an agreement on performance. Never. There's always several different years that people think are the best years. Probably, and that's maybe a little bit, you know, uh, a difficult message for you that financials are, are not sufficient to assess performance of a company. And what I would learn for me is we have to be really careful when designing a compensation system based on financials. This is really what I want to say. I, wanna, I just, I just want to tell you, at the end of the day, when you look at the performance, there's always going to be disagreement. It's difficult to be convincing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I've never experienced another situation. There, was, there were always other opinions. And if you add more numbers to look at, there's not more agreement. It's complicated. It gets just more complicated. I think what we have to, what we probably have to learn again is to be more um, suspicious of numbers when it comes to incentive compensation. I'm not saying you don't have to look at the numbers. They tell a lot. But linking compensation to financial numbers is extremely dangerous and the recommendation is use several metrics you know that kind of mitigates the problem up to a certain degree and use less leverage and let's go after to the targets that you just spoke about because this is my third uh, story um, we believe when we set a target for a CEO or for a person and we link a bonus to that that this person is going to is going to reach that target. It's more likely going to reach that target. I think executives should have targets, but they should not be rewarded for reaching their targets. Very fine difference. Targets are important, we know that, but incentivizing on targets is extremely dangerous. I brought you an example too. I've been using that for a while. I already did it in 2009, actually. Uh, I have three companies here where I show the historic profit. Keep it simple. Just look at the profit. We have to look at every metric individually. Where would you set the target? Gildemeister is a machine manufacturer that grew the profit reasonably well over time. It's at a certain point. Novartis had a difficult year 2007 had a big recovery in 2008. And Raiffeisen, of course, as a bank, was hit hard in 2008 from the financial crisis. Where would you set the target? There are many, many different targets you can set. Let's just take a few. Let's assume Gildemeister will say, like, we are happy with this high level that we have achieved. Let's just stay there. Let's say Novartis said, we just survived 2007, you know, I don't think we have to really set our target as high as the best years we've ever had in the history. They may set their target here. And Raiffeisen probably thinks this has been a really bad year. Let's assume we are back up here afterwards. So this is just an assumption, which you know, typic, you know, typical forecasting would work that way. Um, now, let's look at what really has happened to these companies. Novartis was actually much better, reached their peak in 2009. Gildemeister had a terrible year 2009, we know. After the credit crisis, there was a big slum in investment. And Raiffeisen actually did come back, as expected, as you may have expected from the past. 
but the more interesting part now is, was that a good performance? What I've done is, I've looked at the peers of these companies. How well did the peers do? I start with Novartis. The peers I've used to do this analysis are from the Novartis annual report. It's the peers they use to benchmark their compensation. The peers performed a lot better in 2009 than Novartis. Novartis, with a top performance compared to their history, was actually in the lowest quartile. And the interesting part is, you know what the board decided in 2010? It's actually in their annual report. They decided 2009 was such a good year that they have to pay Daniel Vasella more than in, that is allowed in their regulations. And they had to make an exceptional decision in the board to pay more than what he was allowed by their own statutes. That's how they assessed 2009. Because, you know, probably he exceeded the targets that they set the year before. Who knows? Sorry, it's difficult to, to believe that the board doesn't look at these figures. It is amazingly difficult to believe. Huh? It's, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm, I'm really amazed that they don't look at that. Maybe not like you. No, they don't do. You know, the situation where people don't look at these numbers, they don't want to know the truth. They have invested a lot of time setting the target. They have achieved the target. And when you look at their annual report, it actually says, we achieved the targets that we set ourselves. And this is much more important than what anybody else does, because it could taint their picture. What do you do in this situation, where all the targets are reached, but you underperformed? Do you say, our targets were bad? Impossible. No, they will lose face. But they will lose face, exactly. Not give an additional uh, bonus to Vazela if you lose face, but that's important, you know. That's important. You you focus, you know, on your own processes. Actually, the CEO that I told you got an eighty thousand raise just for nothing. At the same lunch, he told me that. Um, he told me that he also, he also wanted to uh, forfeit his bonus. He didn't want to take his bonus because he had such a bad year. And you know what the board told him when he said, I don't want to have the bonus for this year? What's your guess? You have to take it. You have to take it. Why? Why do you have to take it? Because it's a very bad sign towards outside if we suddenly agree our performance was bad. The invest relations told him to take it. The board to told him to take it. He couldn't. He could not not take the bonus because of what he communicates towards the outside world. The problem is transparency. Hmm? The problem is transparency. If nobody would have known what he was being paid, he could have forfeited that bonus. See, if the outside world. Didn't yeah, the problem is again transparency. We're coming back to the introduction of the speech, absolutely. Now let's look at what happened to Raiffeisen. Um, here actually we have uh, a very much the same picture as you know, our, tar our, our goal would have set. The interesting why I like to show this slide is, it's amazing how much a company is aligned with the peers. And that's another reason why people don't like to look at peers. It's quite sobering at the end of the day, that you can outperform the peers by a little bit, but by never, never as dramatic as you would like to. It's just the reality. And the reality for most companies, we do such benchmarks for, our co for companies that use it in compensation purposes, a, co a benchmark. The reality, the average of our companies that use our index are at the 50th percentile. Kind of makes sense. Kind of makes sense and makes you think, why should we want to reward a CEO for reaching a target? Doesn't make sense. Even worse, if you look at Gildemeister, Gildemeister had a terrible year, but they outperformed their, their, their peers. Now, what do typical boards do when they see something like that? You know, They actually haven't been that good you know, without looking at the peers. They haven't been that good in the past, but this has been a dreadful year for them. They typically start with restructuring projects. Is it a good idea to start a restructuring project when you manage the crisis better than anybody else? <laughs> it's not. That's why I think it's much better to not set, to not set your compensation based on targets. They don't have any meaning, though. If, I, if, if you say, this is what I'd like you to do, this margin is what I like, and, and, but you're not going to get paid for that. Wow. 
how does the CEO react? I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. I'm just wondering, everybody's kind of, at the end of the day, thinking about incentives. It's, it's, and if the targets don't mean anything for me financially, mm -hmm. maybe I don't care. Yeah, we, we shouldn't forget that until about 20 years ago, yeah. UBS didn't have a bonus here in Switzerland. Until about 20 years ago, incentives for executives have been completely absent. And they also worked quite well. I mean, there are so many incentives in a CEO role. Think of it, you know, getting a job in a bigger company for most CEOs. Um, after retirement, becoming a board member. These are all financial incentives. The pride, you know, which is a very good incentive, the pride, these are all strong incentives for CEOs to perform well. And there is the peer pressure. The board knows what the people are doing. They can talk to each other. And you cannot just do nothing. It's impossible. You have to perform. And now when it comes to how good are boards actually in setting targets? How good are they, actually? There was a, a research that I read in Daniel Kahneman's book that uh, 2,000 uh, US CFOs were asked where their share price is uh, next year, and where it actually was had the lowest likelihood <laughs> of all the predictions. Um, I, I made an analysis, and I said, OK, in, in case people are good at target setting, would mean that you know, on average, the boards get their targets more or less right and pay when people are above average, they pay more. And when people are below average, they pay less. If I, if I assume the target setting is done well, I would um, find in the data, whenever companies perform well, their pay is higher. So when they're better than the peers, their pay is higher. Whenever companies perform worse than their peers, the pay is lower because the target setting was done so well that you knew what was possible for that company. And I analyzed the payments of the CEOs and compared it to their relative performance against their peers. Can you follow me? I used you know, how much they have received and how well they performed relative to their peers. So this would now be an outperformance bonus, Raiffeisen would have an average bonus, and Novartis would have received the below average bonus if the target setting were right. And this is what I found out in the US. If you look at performance here, you know, how many, pe how many peers did I outperform? And the millions that actually CEOs received is what you see up there. There is no correlation. There's no correlation. So any targets that were set in the US, even what you don't see here, it's, it's over a period of three years. So a period of three years, not just one year. Any target setting that was done in the US didn't have a correlation with the payments that they actually paid out. Same in the United Kingdom. And in Switzerland, it's even worse. And I did this analysis two or three years ago, uh, got even into The Economist, which made me really happy. Uh, but just this summer, Bloomberg did the analysis. And on, um, on July 22nd, they showed stock return rank versus CEO pay, pay rank for 200 executives in the US. And they have an R square of 0 0.01. My conclusion is targets are outdated the minute you set them. You should not use targets for incentive purposes. You should only use them for management purposes. It's already 10 past 1. I come to the last slide. <laughs> um, compensation without fairy tales. Um, don't blame the executives for the problem of executive pay. Find the solution with the regulators and the shareholder value enthusiasts who still ask for more transparency and more leverage pay. Be, carry, be very careful with any profit-based metric. While I, I agree it's an important metric, it's probably one of the important, most important metrics, um, don't forget that growth suffers. And at the end of the day, people cannot agree on performance. 
using more metrics and maybe some personal judgments helps mitigate that problem. And finally, and that is really, really true, don't set bonus targets for incentive purposes. They're outdated the minute you set them. Thank you very much.